Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. Have you ever taken a stroll through a cemetery? For some, that's a strange question. They want as little as possible to do with the dead. But history is written on the headstones of the people we never knew. If you want to better understand a community, it helps to walk amongst the memorials of those who came before. Recurring names tell us something of the families who founded the community, their ethnicity, and their culture. Common years of death can speak to a shared tragedy, a particularly harsh winter, or a deadly plague. And just in case you're inclined to dismiss the graveyard as a poor substitute for a community's organized and orderly death records, it's often the inscriptions and the symbols, only found on the graves themselves, that will convey the most important information. Beloved wife, cherished son, killed in action, called home to God. The symbols we so often see on older graves are harder to decipher, but with the right knowledge, their secrets can be revealed. An engraving of a book, for example, often marks the grave of a scholar, a writer, or a person of devout faith. A lily of the valley or a broken rosebud suggests a pure and innocent life cut painfully short. A right hand is one of the most common symbols. Pointing up, it tells us that the dead have gone to heaven. Pointing down, it is the hand of God deliberately selecting the soul, suggesting a sudden death. Clasped with another, it is both the soul saying goodbye to the living and being welcomed into the afterlife, often indicating that the family knew death was approaching. Gravestones can tell stories. In a quiet cemetery in rural Ontario, on a little rise amongst thousands of acres of rolling farmland, stands a gravestone that's nothing like anything you've seen before. And the story it tells is as mysterious and intriguing as the cryptic message carved into its worn and weathered face. You're listening to Fireside Canada, my podcast about Canadian legends, lies, and lore. I'm David Williams. Tonight, the strange story of a gravestone that has baffled people for over 150 years. For some, it's little more than a local oddity. For others, it's a mystery that demands to be solved. But once we uncover its solution, we may find that it comes with more questions and some unsettling implications. Join me as we solve a century-old puzzle and learn about the curious history, fascinating folklore, and dubious medical advice that are part of the story of one of Canada's strangest gravesites. This is the story of the puzzling gravestone of Waterloo County, Ontario. Part 1. The Gravestone. Russia's Presbyterian Union Cemetery lies 30 kilometers west of Kitchener in southwestern Ontario, four kilometers due north of the village of Wellesley. The drive is a pleasant one. Fruit farms and cornfields extend from the roadside to the horizon. Livestock graze in green pastures beneath bright, endless skies. The occasional dust cloud rolls across the two-lane road, kicked up by a distant tractor tilling soil. And signs designate certain sections of road as special lanes, reserved both for bicycles and horse-drawn buggies. Sure enough, the occasional square-shaped Mennonite buggy will squeak by on rubber tires, a well-groomed horse happily pulling it along the asphalt. The cemetery can surprise you if you're not ready for it. A short gravel lane lined with evergreens, just perpendicular from near center of a cracked and bowed stretch of Regional Road 5, which runs north to south through seemingly endless farmland. A Methodist church once stood on the property, on land donated by the Elisha Rush family. It was sold at the end of the 19th century, and now only the graves and the trees remain. 
Our focus lies at the back, facing away from the road in the southeast corner of the cemetery. As we approach, it looks just like any other headstone. An upright slab, cambered at the top, and made of relatively thin, weathered white marble. Straightforward, unassuming, even modest when you compare it to some of the newer, sturdier blocks of stone scattered through the grounds. But then you come around to the front, and you're immediately struck by its strangeness and complexity. It starts simple enough. At the top, you can barely make out the words, Gone Home, carved into the moss-eaten, rain-worn apex of the arch. Below that is a relief sculpture of a hand pointing up. Then the surname, Bean, B-E-A-N, followed by two first names, Henrietta and Susanna. So far, so good. Everything is as expected. Two names on one headstone is not unheard of, especially when, as many locals speculated, the two were siblings. Then things start to get strange. Beneath the names of the deceased, where you'd expect to find the usual information, the dates of birth and death and some idea of who these people were, is a square grid of seemingly random letters and numbers that dominate the marker, spanning edge to edge. At the very bottom, just a few inches from the ground, are these words. Reader, meet us in heaven. It's a puzzle. Here, tucked away in this tiny graveyard, and it's begging to be solved. Those last words are a clear invitation, a challenge even, that almost seems to promise eternal salvation to whoever can solve it. It also presents a bit of a mystery. Who were Henrietta and Susanna Bean, and why was their headstone so strangely designed? Unfortunately, the grave has seen better days. Once gleaming white with clear, stately, serif letters painstakingly carved into its face, it's now a splotchy gray from a century and a half of moss, wind, and rain. The stone is mostly illegible. The middle is almost completely worn away from all of the potential puzzle solvers who, throughout the decades, have taken rubbings of the mystery text. Luckily, in 1982, a memorial company based in Kitchener donated a replica of the gravestone that they made from granite, a much more resilient material that will better stand the test of time. And it gives all of us today a chance at solving the mystery. So let's do that. If you want to try to solve it on your own, you should stop here. I've uploaded a photo of the gravestone along with a walkthrough of how to solve it on my website, firesidecanada.ca. Just click on this episode to see the show notes. From here, I'll do my best to describe the solution, but know that, even with the stone right in front of you, it can be terribly confusing. Ready? Let's go. First, let's get a basic layout. The Bean Gravestone puzzle is a square of alphanumeric characters arranged in an orderly grid of 15 rows by 15 columns. That's 225 letters and numbers in total. It looks exactly like a word search, and that's essentially what it is, though it follows its own set of rules. It's important to note that, while some have called the Bean Headstone a cryptogram, it's not. There's no cipher for us to use or code for us to crack. You just have to know where to start. If you stare at it long enough, a few words start to appear, giving us our first clues. The words, aged 23 years, stood out to me first. The first word, aged, can be found roughly below the center of the stone, starting at row 11, column 7, and moving right. The number 23 comes next. From there, move up to spell out the word years. You can also see Susanna, the name of one of the deceased, running vertically down the third column, starting at row 7. These two discoveries hint that the message is running in a sort of counterclockwise spiral. If we look to the center of the stone, seven rows across, seven columns down, we will find the center of that spiral and the beginning of the message, starting with the letter I. Moving one space at a time in a counterclockwise, inconsistent, zigzagging swirl, the message is revealed. In memoriam, Henrietta, 
first wife of S. Bean, M.D., who died 27th September, 1865, aged 23 years, 2 months, and 17 days, and Susanna, his second wife, who died 27th April, 1867, aged 26 years, 10 months, and 15 days. Two better wives one man never had. They were gifts from God, but are now in heaven. May God help me, S.B., to meet them there. Perhaps unsurprisingly, we find an epitaph with the usual names, dates, and sentiments of the bereaved, one S. Bean. At first glance, it's a rather unremarkable message written in a remarkable way. Some have called his puzzle a heartfelt tribute, an important message of love, and in the words of one newspaper editor, quote, perhaps his way of expressing the enigma of life that can only be understood after death, end quote. Some writers have even begun to fabricate their own stories about the beans, imagining that they must have shared an obsession and love for puzzles, making it seem romantic and intimate. But if you're like me, you might find the whole solution unsettling, as we're left with more questions than answers. Like, why were two unrelated women buried in the same grave? Why do they die less than two years apart after marrying the same man? And why did the mysterious Dr. Bean feel the need to include his title of MD and reference himself not once, but twice? The final sentence that ends the epitaph is, to me, the most jarring, because he's not memorializing the dead, but rather saying a prayer for himself. May God help me, SB, to meet them. It's so surprising that a local newspaper reporter was convinced it was an error. The letter B, he writes, quote, has no place in the puzzle. If made an O, it completes the word so in the puzzle's final phrase. I like to think that Samuel had these false letters engraved to have the last laugh on his township neighbors, end quote. But looking at both the original gravestone and its replica, we can see that its author deliberately placed periods beside the S and the B to make it clear they were his initials. Finally, there's the medium itself. We expect gravestones to honor the dead, to readily share information about the deceased, but the details about these two unfortunate women are locked behind a whimsical puzzle of their husband's design, as if the monument is dedicated more to his clever mind than to their memory. Now, you might think that's a lot to read into an old gravestone. And you'd be right. But the more you look into the history, the more you realize that there's something off about Dr. Bean. Part 2. What about Bean? If you read about the Bean puzzle headstone online, you'll quickly find the claim, repeated again and again, that it took over a century to solve, and that the feat was ultimately accomplished by a 94-year-old woman sometime in the 1970s or 80s. These details have become yet another part of the folklore, but they're incorrect the result of exaggeration, misleading headlines, and poor reading comprehension. The earliest record I could find of someone solving the puzzle is in the June 17th edition of the Windsor Star, where Mrs. Florence Flossie Dewar provides an accurate translation. Years later, she would clarify that she had solved the puzzle back in 1934 after several weeks of work, but she was not the first. As far as she knew, it was John Hammond, the former caretaker of the cemetery, who had first cracked it in the early 1920s. He had copied down the inscription while waiting for the arrival of a funeral cortege, took it home, and worked on it on rainy days over the course of several months. It's likely that others who came before Mr. Hammond solved the puzzle as well. Their accomplishments just went unrecorded. It seems like many in the area grew up hearing stories about the mysterious Dr. Bean. Mrs. Dewar remembered hearing her grandparents talk about an enigmatic doctor from the area who had buried his two deceased wives together and left town to become a minister. In 1955, Mr. Hammond recalled that, quote, 
there was always some question whether Bean was a qualified medical man, end quote. And in 1992, a retired farmer and then vice president of the Wellesley Historical Society speculated that Bean's puzzling gravestone, quote, was an attempt to psych the people in the area, to dominate or scare them, end quote. And according to an article from 1992, some locals thought that Bean may have, quote, dabbled in metaphysics or the supernatural, end quote. They may have had good reason to be suspicious of his qualifications. According to historical records, Samuel Bean was born in Wilmot Township, just west of modern-day Kitchener, Ontario, on March 24, 1842. His grandfather, John, had come to America from Switzerland in 1742, and in 1800, the Bean family joined their fellow Pennsylvania Germans who traveled north to Upper Canada, becoming some of the first settlers to arrive in what is now Waterloo County, Ontario in the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. As a young man, Samuel moved to Pennsylvania and worked briefly as a school teacher before moving on to study medicine at a college in Philadelphia. While there, he met and married a young woman around the same age named Henrietta Furry. He returned to Canada in 1865 with a medical degree and a new bride. The happy couple settled in Linwood, and Samuel Bean, M.D., became the region's first doctor, specializing in, quote, physic, surgery, and midwifery. Seven months later, Henrietta was dead. We know that there was some sort of funeral service held for Henrietta. What we don't know is how the attendees reacted when Samuel handed each of them a special black-bordered funeral card featuring a baffling grid of letters and numbers in no clear sequential order. It was, as far as we know, the first puzzle that Samuel Bean would create for a dead spouse, and it was a precursor to his enigmatic epitaph. You read the card in a similar way to how you read the gravestone starting at the center and moving in a counterclockwise spiral until you reach the end, though no zigzagging is required for this one. We don't know if Samuel helped mourners in their efforts to solve his puzzle, but once they cracked it, they would receive this message. In Memoriam Henrietta Furry Bean, born in Penn, married in Philadelphia to Samuel Bean, M.D., and went with him to Canada, leaving all of her friends behind. Died in Linwood, the 27th of September, 1865, after an illness of 11 weeks, aged 23 years, 2 months, and 17 days. She was a model wife, one of 1,000, much regretted by her sorrowing husband and all who knew her. Lived a godly life for five years, and died happy in the Lord. Peace be to her ashes, so mote it be. By the following summer, Samuel Bean had married again, this time to a woman from the nearby town of Wellesley named Susanna Clegg. That too ended in tragedy when she died just nine months and one week later on April 27, 1867, eight days after giving birth to a daughter. Samuel Bean buried Susanna in the same plot as Henrietta, erected their now infamous gravestone, and left Canada for good. According to legend, he never shared the secret to solving his puzzle. At first, you might be suspicious by the fact that Henrietta and Susanna died so close together, exactly one year and seven months to the day, or by the fact that neither survived a year after marrying Samuel Bean. The truth is, back then death was all too common, and it's highly probable that, like many young women in the 19th century, both died from complications of childbirth. The cause of death is not suspicious, but what is suspicious are the credentials of the doctor who cared for them in their final days. Samuel Bean wasn't a medical doctor, no matter what his puzzles claimed. He earned his medical degree from the Eclectic Medical College of Pennsylvania, and if that name didn't tip you off already, it wasn't the most esteemed institution. A few modern articles on the Bean gravestone have called the ECM a diploma mill, but that's selling it short. 
It was THE diploma mill, the most notorious by far, known across the continent as a physician factory, pumping out thousands of fake qualifications for certified quacks at 40 bucks a sheet. The dean, John Buchanan, was so crooked that when a federal grand jury indicted him for mail fraud, he posted $15,000 bail, hopped onto a ferry in the early morning hours, and then threw himself overboard into the Delaware River in an attempt to fake his death. He swam ashore, fled to Pittsburgh, then Detroit, and finally into Canada, where he took on a fake name and tried to make some money by putting on a series of medical lectures and, quote, spiritualistic entertainment, end quote. Eventually, he was lured back to the U.S. and arrested. The man and his school were so infamous that, in the medical community, his name became synonymous with fraud. Even a decade later, if someone called your medical degree Buchananistic, it might as well have been written in crayon. But that alone doesn't tell the whole story. Part 3. Magic, Mystery, and Medicine in the early 19th century, the world of American medicine was a bit like the Wild West. There were few laws and almost no regulation. Standard medical practice included bloodletting, blistering, and purging. It was a time when doctors readily gave their patients mercury and other mineral poisons to bring their bodies back into balance. And when washing one's hands before shoving them into a patient's body was considered controversial. In response to invasive practices that were considered standard procedure, some began to embrace alternative schools of thought that focused on milder, botanical treatments. Eclectic medicine was one of those schools, drawing from various sources of traditional knowledge and herbal remedies to treat disease. Now, that sounds pretty good, especially when a more mainstream doctor is pushing you to swallow a few mercury pills. Eclectic medicine was, at the time, considered a legitimate practice, and at first, the EMC was considered a legitimate medical school. But by 1867, the same year Samuel Bean returned home, it was churning out fake diplomas at a remarkable rate. Whether Bean actually worked for his diploma or simply bought it for cash is anyone's guess, but it's a certainty that he lacked the necessary knowledge or experience to be considered a medical doctor, not unlike other so-called doctors of early Ontario history. Much of what is now Waterloo County, Ontario, was first settled by Pennsylvania Germans in 1800 and again in 1806. Most were farmers. A wave of old country German settlers, mostly tradesmen, followed in 1825 and continued until about 1840. Doctors were hard to find, but folk healers were more common. The most famous is probably Dr. John Troyer, folk healer and hero of Long Point, Ontario, most famous for his role in the Baldoon Mystery. Listen to my episode on that topic for more information. Blending Christianity, folk magic, and spiritualism, these healers used a combination of faith healing, herbal remedies, and magical spells and charms to make sense of the world and attempt to cure almost any condition. It's likely that many homes would have had a copy of Der Lang Verborgen Freund, The Long Lost Friend, a very popular book at the time written by a Pennsylvania German healer that was bursting with, quote, true Christian instructions, end quote folk remedies, and spells. It teaches you everything, from how to brew good beer using hops, molasses, and ginger, to how to cure a sick cow using three pieces of paper, a pot, and the skull of a criminal. This kind of wisdom was alive and well in Waterloo County at the turn of the 20th century, when Canadian archaeologist, Waterloo native, and amateur folklorist W.J. Wintenberg began interviewing the locals. Now, I've been dying to share this stuff with you, because it comes from one of the first books I personally collected on Canadian folklore, and it's full of amazing and downright bizarre knowledge. What Wintenberg found was a fascinating collection of practical folk wisdom and questionable cures, knowledge that many local healers would have relied on and, I suspect, that would have been welcomed by any practitioner of eclectic medicine. Here are a few quotes. 
it goes without saying you shouldn't try these at home. Cold Cures. A familiar cold cure is a tea made from the flowers of the common mulun. For sore throat, take the sock off your left foot, turn it inside out, and wear it around your neck. It is said the cure will be more effectual if the sock is red. Stopping flow of blood. Cobwebs are used as a styptic for flesh cuts or wounds. For bad temper, pass the child head first through the left leg of its father's trousers. For the eyes, take the blood of a bat and bathe your eyes with it, and you will be able to see as well in the dark as you can in the daytime. To render oneself invisible at pleasure, place a certain bone of a black cat between your teeth. How do you get the bone? First, put a kettle on the fire and get it boiling. Next, wait until midnight, and then... Okay, okay, I'm going to stop there, because that last one is literally a crime. The list goes on, and I think you get it. According to Wintenberg, the practice of charming and healing in this way was called broche, and often involved mystic words, magic ritual, and invoking the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And as you can see, it was a bit of a mixed bag. Some of these folk remedies are well-founded. Spiderwebs have been used as bandages since at least the first century. It's even referenced by Shakespeare. And one modern study suggests that they might accelerate healing. Claims of the medicinal properties of the common mullen seem to be supported by an increasing number of research studies, including a medical article published in 2020. But we can't ignore the magic socks or the bloodletting. It's like seeing a dermatologist who tells you to rub aloe vera on a burn, which is very sound advice, but then in the same breath tells you to rub a live baby goose over your child's face to prevent freckles. Advice, by the way, that is part of the folklore of Waterloo County. Now, to be clear, I don't want to pick on one culture's folk medicine. Some of these same beliefs can be found in English, Irish, and Old World German folklore as well. You'll find references in Shakespeare, English Proverbs, and in the works of Jacob Grimm. And remember, at the time, conventional medicine wasn't much better. Back in the 1860s, if you went to a doctor because your seasonal allergies made it difficult to breathe, he might tell you to smoke a few cigarettes, then toss you a vial of cocaine and send you on your way. The point is, this was likely the kind of medicine that Samuel Bean practiced as a quote-unquote doctor. He was born in Waterloo County, raised in Pennsylvania German culture, and fancied himself a healer. He carried a dubious diploma from a very suspicious school that, at first, embraced all forms of traditional healing, from the practical to the questionable. His use of the phrase, so mote it be, in his first wife's funeral card, suggests he may either have been a Freemason or dabbled in spiritualism, much like the disgraced dean and former instructor of the very school he attended. And it may be a coincidence, but the fact his puzzles move in a counterclockwise direction, also known as Wittershins, is reminiscent of how one might cast a spell in circle magic. We can only speculate about Samuel Bean's beliefs and true abilities as a healer, but I think most would agree that he lacked the necessary qualifications to act as a doctor, surgeon, and midwife. It's likely that his wives, Henrietta and Susanna, were in his care when they died, probably from complications of childbirth, though their cause of death was never recorded. And I can't help but wonder if his medical malpractice may have been a contributing factor, and if they might have survived under the care of a more professional doctor or experienced midwife. Samuel Bean left Canada by 1868. It's unclear if he brought his newborn daughter with him or left her in the care of her mother's family. He became a minister of the Evangelical Church and claimed to have read the Bible 65 times all the way through. He married a third time, had five more children, and moved with his family through Iowa and New York before finally settling in Florida. He died in 1904 at the age of 61 when a boat he was on capsized off the coast of Cuba and his body was lost at sea. 
His headstone, marking an empty grave in Bronson, Florida, contains no puzzles of any kind. Throughout the years, the puzzle tombstone has risen in popularity, thanks to websites like Atlas Obscura, and many have praised Dr. Bean as a brilliant and deeply religious man with a keen mind. But they ignore his shady credentials, the fact that two unrelated women were forced to share one grave, and the fact that he made the tombstone more about him than the departed. It's true that women from that era were seen more as property than people, but as writer Halle Gattery points out, they were still buried in their own graves with their own tombstones. You could argue that the novelty of Bean's puzzle tombstone helped to ensure that Henrietta and Susanna would never be forgotten. And I'd agree, but I would also argue that it makes people focus more on the designer than the dead. And that may have been his intentions all along. Regardless, I think we can all agree that it tells an interesting story that helps us learn more about the culture and the folklore of a community, and helps keep the past alive. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening, and for joining me in becoming part of a Canadian folk tradition. Now that you know the story, share it. And remember, if you're ever in Waterloo County, consider stopping by Russia's Cemetery to try your hand at decoding the infamous gravestone, and to pay your respects to Henrietta and Susanna. Gone too soon. Fireside Canada is written and recorded by me, David Williams, with sound design by Matt Kesselman. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Diana Kay is our business manager. Jordan Heath Rawlings is our executive producer. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving this podcast a positive review. If you want to help even further, you can provide story ideas and more through my website. Every little bit helps to keep the fire burning and the library of legends growing. Learn more at firesidecanada.ca.